please stand for the reading of God's word. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter 1, 3 through 11. Thanks, Shona. When I was a senior in college, I had the great and wonderful opportunity to be a teacher's assistant in a class. I discovered that wanting to be a teacher's assistant and actually being a teacher's assistant were two different things. Because what I discovered is the majority of my task, the majority of my job, was simply to grade papers and to proctor exams. And one of the classes that I had to do an exam in was a very large freshman class in an auditorium very similar to that. There was over 200 students. And the professor gave me very clear instructions. He said, when you do an exam, here's what happens. At 9 o'clock, promptly you'll say, begin. They can come in after and begin, but at 9 o'clock, they begin the, qu the test. And at 9.50, exactly, not 9.51, but at 9.50, you say, pencils down, time's up. And if the pencils don't go down, and if, the time, and if they don't stop and immediately stand up and bring their test to you, they get an F. There's no grace. Some of you may have had teachers like that. It was okay for me. You see, I, I was the teacher's assistant, so I could just enforce the rules. So one particular day, um, it was time for a test. And all 200-plus students were there, and they brought their blue books. Do you remember? Do they still use blue books? Right? Some of them do. They had to, everyone brought their blue book, and they had their pencils, and at 9 o'clock, begin. They opened the blue books, and they began the test. And at 9.50, time's up. Pencils down. And it just seemed like this, this universal noise. They, they were so well trained. It was just like, boom, pencils down. Boom, blue books closed. Boom, everybody stood up and they started bringing their tests down and they were to place them on the corner of the desk and then they could leave. And yet I noticed that it was everyone except for one guy. I think he thought he was being sneaky. He was all the way up in the back and he was just writing away. And I said it again just because I thought I'd have a little bit of grace and I said, time's up. Pencils down. He just kept on writing up there. He kept on writing. So it takes a few minutes, and all of the rest of the class had gathered their things, and they brought the, uh, their blue books down, and they had stacked them in a semi-neat pile on the corner of the desk. And just as the last person was getting ready to leave, that sneaky guy up in the top who wasn't so sneaky anymore, he jumped up, and he closed his blue book, and he came running down. He said, here, 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 I'm done. Take my blue book. Take my test. And I said, what did I say? No way. I said, you know the rules, 9.50 exactly, and it is now 9.53. <laughs> and I, then I said, then I felt a little sorry. I said, hey, listen, sorry, I'm sorry, buddy, but these aren't my rules. I'm just the teacher's assistant, right? I can't accept, oh, please take my test, Mr. Eby, please. No one called me Mr. Eby. It made me feel good back then because I was a young kid. And he said, please take my test. I said, hey, my mom and dad will kill me if I get an F in this class. I said, I'm sorry, I can't do anything about it. So he turned slowly and he began to walk away and he got about halfway up to the top where his stuff was and then he stopped. And he turned around and it seemed like a different kid. It was like a smug look on his face, a look of confidence. I, I'm not really sure what was going on. And he came marching back down and he came up to me and said, Mr. Eby, do you know who I am? And I looked at him and I said, no, I really don't. 
There's 250 plus kids and I do all these classes. I don't know who you are. He said, are you absolutely sure that you don't know who I am? I'm starting to get a little worried. I wonder, is this the dean's son? You know, am I, am I going to be in trouble? And I have to say, on, I, sorry, I don't know who you are. Are you absolutely, positively sure that you don't know who I am? I said, I'm sorry, I, I don't know who you are. He said, good, and he grabbed half those tests. He stuck his test in there, and he slammed them down and straightened them out and ran out the door. <laughs> True story. <laughs> oh, I wish I'd have thought about that when I was in class. <laughs> so you might be wondering, what does that have to do with our text today? Well, I think that all of us are familiar with the purpose of school. At least I hope we are. The idea of school is to help us grow in our social skills and our mental skills so that we'll be better prepared to go out into the world, into the job force, and do whatever it is that, that God has called us to do, we hope. It is equally true, I hope you realize, in the Christian life that God wants us to go to school to become the very best Christians that we can possibly be. Like Pastor Kyle was talking, exercise our faith, our spiritual muscle, so that it gets stronger and stronger. Now, I have to tell you, in this Christian life, this journey we're going on, there will be no blue books, and there will be no 50-minute tests, but God intends that every one of us would succeed on this journey to become mature in Christ. In fact, we are on this journey. I hope we are. And if you aren't, I invite you to go with us to become mature in Christ. Now, it's not a, a seven-week program or a 12-week program, and when you finish that, you get a certificate and you can say to everyone proudly, hey, I've completed this program. I am now mature in my faith. I am now a mature Christian. It, it really doesn't work that way. You know, that's the kind of, kind of offer the world makes, isn't it? They say, if you'll take this test, or if you'll take this class, by the way, you've got to pay your money, if you'll take this class and, and you'll pay your money and you'll do it with this group of people, or if you'll take this class with this group of people at this time and pay your money, and if you'll do this thing with this group of people at this time standing on one leg and pay your money, then you'll get the certificate and it will prove to you that you've finally arrived and you've accomplished something. Folks, that isn't the way it works in the Christian life, is it? The awful truth is you cannot buy your way to spiritual maturity. You will not become mature, I hate to tell you, by walking in the doors of the church. Even if you're in here, every time the doors are open, that won't automatically make you mature. And even if you have been in church your whole life, I mean for many, 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 many years, it won't just make you mature. You won't become mature by walking into a church any more than you will become mature by walking into an algebra class and holding the book. What do you have to do? You have to open the book. You have to study it. You have to read. You have to plan. You have to take the test. It won't happen automatically. But it amazes me how many in the church haven't figured out the purpose, the plan, and the goal for every single one of us. I don't care who we are or what age we are, is that we would grow up in Christ. The word tells us, brothers, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking and your behavior, be adults. And instead, speaking the truth in love, you will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. You, you see, it's not enough to get in. There's a lot of people who might want to tell you that it's all about getting in, and, and don't get me wrong, it is important to get into this relationship with Jesus. But I submit to you, it's not enough just to get in. We have to do something when we're there, right? God intends for us to grow and to move forward. So what are you doing while you're here? Oh, I don't mean here today necessarily right now or in this church, but in this Christian life, in this relationship with Jesus, what are you doing while you're here? Are you doing anything worthwhile? Or, or is all you're doing sitting there with your mouth open saying, feed me, feed me, feed me, like a baby bird? You see, that's the goal for all of us, for our children, isn't it, that they would grow up? And they would get to the place where we don't just have to feed them and, and give them and, and, and take care of them and diaper them. 
and pat them on the heads all the time. Our goal is that our children would grow up and they would become mature and they would actually be, get to the place where they can give back rather than just taking all the time. I remember one time I went into my mom and I accused her of having a bunch of kids just so she could make us work. She told me that was true. And I believed her. <laughs> but that's the ultimate test of maturity, isn't it? That we would grow up, whether we get to the place where we give and not just take. So are you a giver or a taker? Is the primary focus of your life being ministered to or is it ministering to others? Do you need constant attention and encouragement and building up or are you intentionally being an encouragement to others? Do you see needs and, and wonder why no one's taking care of them? Or do you see a need and say, I wonder if I can help. I wonder what I can do to make it possible to meet that need. The good news is that it really is possible to grow in your relationship with Christ. It isn't an age thing. Listen to me, children, teens, it is just as possible for you to grow and mature in your faith as the oldest person here. And in fact, sometimes it's easier because your minds aren't as cluttered up as the rest of us. That's why Jesus said, not only do we have to have the faith of a mustard seed, but if we want to get into heaven, we have to have to have faith like a child whose brain isn't all cluttered up and we aren't trying to figure it out, right? Growing older is, an op growing older is not an option, but maturing is something we choose to do. I've taught a lot of classes through the MIT Ministers and Training Program, and in one class, it was a theology class, um, it dealt with this issue, and here's what it said. Apparently, growth is not inevitable or automatic. Growing is what the believer does by choice. There's no way to minimize or escape the total and consistent New Testament teaching on the importance of going forward in the Christian life, nor is this essential progress nor that this essential progress is squarely up to the believer. In other words, God won't make us do it. We have to choose to do it. We have to choose to grow and mature in our relationship with Him. So today, as we begin this new phase of our journey, perhaps there are someone who want to intentionally move forward and grow in your relationship with Christ. We're going to use today's text, just the part that I, I failed to get it all up there, but Shauna read the whole text, as a template for what it looks like for a maturing, notice I don't say mature, but a maturing Christian. I encourage you, in fact, to take this passage out of 2 Peter and memorize it. It's one of the first ones that I did. It's a great passage, and it will help us to mature in our relationship with Christ. So here it is. I invite you to sit back, let the Holy Spirit listen, and let's get ready to... No, we're not going to rumble. Let's get ready to grow up in Christ. I know. It's not as much fun, is it? Here it is. The first promise is this. From the Scripture, we are promised that we will get everything we need. It says, His divine power has given us everything we need. It's right there. Black and white. It's there. His divine power. Back in 1945, World War II came to an abrupt end. The world was shocked as a bomb was dropped on the city of Hiroshima, literally destroying the city and killing thousands upon thousands of people. The world was absolutely shocked that such a small device could create such incredible devastation. It's not one of our finest moments in human history, is it? And the fact is, mankind has become the master of this world, and we have developed some pretty incredible, powerful things. We have got to the point, folks, we should just pat ourselves on the back, that we can now, with our combined nuclear, nuclear power, destroy our world at least seven times over. Every human being on the face of the earth at least seven times over. Yay for us! And isn't it amazing that the most incredible, powerful things that we come up with as human beings all seem to be destructive? I mean, we can destroy ourselves seven times, and yet we don't have the cure for the common cold. Imagine what good we could do if we put the energy into that kind of stuff rather than destruction. 
And yet, hear me, in the midst of how incredibly powerful we think that we have become as human beings, it is nothing compared to God's power. God's power is immeasurably more. I like this illustration because it shows it. We can destroy our world. We can literally do that, but God holds the world. God is in control. And the crazy, incredible thing about it is not just the miracles that God has done, but we read through Scripture that he has taken ordinary human beings just like you and me and done some pretty incredible things through them. In fact, some of the things that those men and women did are still way beyond the abilities of us with all of our technological genius today. And it's not because of our power. It's because of his power. His power has given us everything we need, listen to what it says, for life and godliness. That kind of covers it all, doesn't it? That word life by itself Everything we need for life and godliness, that means living life the way that he would like us to live life, according to our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. That knowledge, we won't break it all down today, we're not going to take the time to do it, but it talks about more than just head knowledge, it talks about heart knowledge, it talks about experiential knowledge, knowing who God is and what God can do for us. Ephesians 1 tells us that God's power is, is available to us right now. And it says in Ephesians 1, the power that's available is the same power that he used when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now I know that we have incredible power for destruction, but what kind of power does it take to raise someone from the dead? That's one thing that we haven't quite figured out yet, is it? Oh, we know how to to extend life and we know how to, to, to help alleviate some diseases, and maybe even cure some diseases. But you know, I haven't figured out anyone or found anyone yet who has figured out how to raise someone from the dead. And Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein doesn't count. Imagine how victorious your life would be if you would put his power to work inside of you. And here's the cool thing. It's available right now. Right now, his divine power has given us everything we need. That's a pretty good promise. Everything, you can make it personal. What is the need in your life right now? What is that thing that's so big? His divine power has given you everything you need. God wants all of his kids to live powerful, spirit-filled lives. And he has made that possible. Hmm. Those who aren't living that way have never really tapped into the power that he has available for us. So here's what I say to you today. Plug into God's power and see what a difference it'll make in your life. The results will shock you. Sorry for the pun. The second promise is this. The promise. The second promise is the promise. Through his great and precious promises... We can participate in the divine nature and escape corruption in the world. It was a very small nation, really tiny compared to the the political superpowers all around it. It didn't seem possible that they could win a single battle, much less take away an entire country from its inhabitants. And yet that's what happens. This little country, insignificant nation of Israel, moved into the land and they literally won battle after battle after battle when it didn't, shouldn't be possible for them to win. It was like almost they had an, an unseen ally helping them. Who would have thought that they could destroy the invincible city of Jericho without a battering ram or a siege engine or even launching a single arrow? And yet this amazing little country of Israel, all of this began with one man. Do you know who that was? Abraham. And a promise because Abraham believed God, God made a promise with him. He made a covenant with him. And from that covenant, from that promise, the nation of Israel sprang. The Messiah was born. And the nation of Israel became a superpower of its day, not through any effort of their own, but through a mighty God because they loved and obeyed him. If you want to know the the rise and fall of a nation, if you want to know what happens when you follow God and what happens when you don't follow God, just read through the Old Testament of Kings. 
Chronicles and King Samuels. And watch how when they served God faithfully, and when they didn't serve God faithfully, I don't know if you've seen that movie Night and Day with Tom Cruise and, and Carmen Diaz. Anyway, it says they're going through struggles in it and, and, um, and he's trying to tell her that she's in trouble and, and her chances of survival are with me, without me. That's exactly what it is with the children of Israel. With God, this is their chances. Without God, with God, without God. It, it, is, a, it is a roller coaster ride. And yet God, yet God blessed them, and Israel still survives. And guess what? Even today, they're surrounded by those superpowers who are around them, all looking to defeat and destroy them. But God always keeps his word. God always keeps his word. The only limit on God's power, the only limit upon what God can do in the lives of his people is the one that we place on ourselves. Our text tells us what happens when we tap into his promises. Through, he has give, through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. God wants to live in your life. God wants to help you. Folk, if he's talking about this back then, there being a corrupt world that we live in, imagine what it's like today. And we can tap into, we can engage in, we can be a part of God's nature, of God's very nature being inside of us. And we can escape the junk in the world, the corruption in the world. We can escape it and, <coughs> excuse me, and find victory over it. In fact, you can find victory beyond your wildest dreams if you will tap into God's power. Here's the key. Only you can limit what God can accomplish through you. I think you'll all agree with me. God's promises are always true. The problem is ours aren't. One more today. Go for it. We like that part. Now for this very reason, apply diligence. Or for this very reason, go for it. I had a friend who was out of college... And um, he'd been out of college for a few years, and he got to the place where he wasn't able to keep up with his youth group anymore, quite like he thought he would. He realized he was starting to get out of shape. So he realized that he needed to get in shape. So he went and borrowed a weight set, dug out the jump rope, put on the sweats, and set everything up in his living room. He was still single at the time, so he could do that. And he began to pump iron, just like he was, you know, 20 again. And he got through with his set, and guess what happened the next morning? He felt exactly like I did after doing cougar cleanup last night getting home at 2 in the morning. He couldn't move. His muscles had seized up. And, you know, but I, I have to give this to him. He was, he was pretty faithful, and he stuck with it, and he, and he got back in there, and he, and he kept lifting, and he, kept, and he finally began to work the, the soreness out. But then after a while, he discovered that this whole getting in shape thing was hard work. Anyone relate? And he found it convenient, or excuses, convenient, legitimate excuses to more and more often miss his workout. And before long, he quit altogether. Poor guy. I, I wonder if any of us are like that. Not me, of course. I would never do that. But maybe not just with physical stuff. Maybe there was a time that you realized that you needed to start a legitimate regiment for growing in your faith with Christ. You know, daily devotions and a prayer time and scripture reading and, and getting involved in a small group or, or whatever that entails. And you started doing that and, and you started maturing and, and moving forward in your faith, but then after a while you realize it's hard work. Do you guys, I, I understand that this, this relationship with Christ, growing in faith, becoming the men and women that God wants us to be, sometimes that's hard work. That's not always easy. Sometimes it just comes down to tough, nose to the grindstone, get it done type work. But the fact is, God wants us to, needs us to continue to grow in our relationship with Him. I meant to put that up for the workout. Hmm. A wise man once said, and I wanted to make sure I got this correctly. Success is directly proportional to effort applied 
and the commitment in applying that effort. In other words, success is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. We are remarkable people, us human beings. Do you know why? It's not some cosmic accident. The reason that we are so remarkable is we were made in God's image and have the ability to do great and incredible things. Listen to me, if we let him work in us and through us. So I challenge you to forget the past and all the times that you have failed in in your attempts to serve God. You know he has. The best way to succeed in doing something is to take it one day at a time. Set your goals. Fix your eyes on Jesus and go for it. If you give 100%, God will work the miracle. I guarantee it. You know, how often do we ask God to work the miracle when we've given less than our best, less than he's asked us to do, less than we can do? You know, it should make sense to us, right? We're all pretty um, independent-minded here. Not just in the Northwest, but we're all pretty independent-minded. I don't know if you have any kids like that who want to do it. You want to help them so bad they're doing such a horrible job, but, you want, but they have to do it. I wonder how God doesn't just grab a hold of us sometime and shake us when we say, let me do it. And God goes, but if, if, just like a good parent, we're remarkable but we have to be willing to give all that we can give and let God work the miracle. And if we do that, I guarantee that he will. In the Christian life, there are some problems, the sin problems that we deal with and those struggles that are only only solved through salvation. If you are not right in your relationship with Jesus Christ, the only way to get right, the only way to get past some of those problems is to ask Jesus to forgive you and to come into your heart and allow him to be your Lord. We understand that. There are other things like, like a worldly mindset, some wrong attitudes, some, some behaviors that sometimes we don't even know exactly why we're responding that way. Those things are solved by allowing God's Holy Spirit to come in and, and completely cleanse us. We call that entire sanctification or holiness. That's allowing God to wipe the, to, to, to take away the, the stuff inside of us. Well, like we talked about before, let him have the closet under the stairs. You know, we say, God, you can have everywhere in our house, but we don't let him get the closet under the stairs where the junk is stored. So we let him clean that out. But there are other things in our life. There are other struggles and battles we have that are only taken care of by spiritual maturity. They may not be sinful of themselves. They're just, they're just behaviors that are, that are immature and childish. And God wants us to grow up in our relationship with him. He wants us to grow and become more and more like Jesus. The question is if we're really going to allow him to do it. So over the next few weeks, as God directs, we're going to take and look at this template in 2 Peter and see what some of these characteristics are of mature Christians. Hopefully, you'll go on the journey with me. Hopefully you will allow God's Holy Spirit to speak into your life. I don't care how old you are or how young you are. Every one of us can move from here to here. Right? The time that we lose is when we quit growing. I tell you that some of the most embarrassing times in my life are when I think I finally got it figured out. (laughs) I think, God, I finally got this whole thing figured out. I know exactly what I need to do right here. And then life happens. I would tell you this. It's just like when I went through uh, all of those years of working out to get my black belt. And when you finally get the black belt, you realize just how much you really don't know. You finally get to that point, which is a big accomplishment, and you realize this is just the beginning place, the starting place of what it really takes. It's the same thing in the Christian life. Yes, Jesus can live on the inside, and he is working in our heart, but he wants us to grow until the day we die. And if we aren't, guess what the option is? Stagnation, failure, going downhill. God's desire is that we would grow up 
and we would mature in Christ. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, thank you. Thank you for the privilege of being your servants. And I pray that you would just come through your Holy Spirit and speak to our hearts. Father, you know that, uh, that we're your kids. We're here. We want to serve you. And I pray that you would be right, right now, that you would be speaking to our hearts and showing us any areas in our lives that we need to surrender to you in a new way, any areas in our lives that we need to grow and mature so that we would truly become the men and women that you want us to become so that we can serve you more fully, we can take authority in our lives the way that you want us to take authority for our own selves and, and for our church, and that we can truly be the witnesses that you want us to be. That we can truly be men and women who are after your heart. So, Father, I pray that you would help us. Some, those who are willing, but let's accept the challenge to, to grab a hold of this passage of Scripture and to read it and to, and to study it and to memorize it and allow it to work and permeate into the very cells of our bodies and deep into our souls so that we truly can become the men and women that you want us to become and truly be lights in this world for you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.